Welcome to Anxiety Slayer. I'm Shan Vanderleek, anxiety coach and co-founder of anxietyslayer.com and the Anxiety Slayer Academy. With almost 7 million downloads and hundreds of podcasts, Anxiety Slayer is an award-winning podcast for anyone suffering from anxiety, PTSD, panic attacks, trauma, and high levels of stress. Today, it's my pleasure and honor to be speaking with Liz Molinar. Liz is a counselor, trauma survivor, and the founder of the Heal for Life Foundation, and has been running internationally recognized trauma recovery programs for over 20 years. We're going to discuss Heal for Life, which is her book and and step-by-step support to help survivors of childhood trauma and abuse heal and gain inner peace, joy, and hope for a brighter future. The Heal for Life model is regarded as one of the most successful programs in the world, and her book covers everything she's learned about healing trauma. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. What a lovely introduction. What what an interesting um, program you run. How fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. We're very grateful to do the work, and we just celebrated Mm -hmm. 10 years together last October and have been producing our show and and doing all we can to bring help. as much support and hope forward. And so having you on our show is such a joy and such a treat because we haven't talked with a counselor like you and an author like you and a, and a woman who has dedicated so much of her life to help trauma survivors. I would love it if we began our conversation today, if you could just share your journey of self-discovery and, and what led you to the creation of the Heal for Life Foundation. Yes, well, my journey started over 25 years ago now. Um, I was in the world of film and television. And I helped create the careers of people like Rose Byrne and Kate Blanchett and Russell Crowe and many of the Australian actors you've heard of. And, and I was um, successful, had five children, And then my world completely changed because I started on that long journey that many of your listeners will know about of discovering that, in fact, I had suffered from very severe abuse as a child. And I, as a sort of successful middle class businesswoman, looked around for help and I was completely stunned when I couldn't find an association, an organization or any kind of. Uh, community activity or people I could share with. This is in the early 1990s. I actually reached out because someone in the media wrote, then we had false memories and they wrote about false memories. And I was so angry uh, that I wrote a letter. I got an enormous response. And then I I kept looking and and I found a wonderful psychologist, but she didn't really understand about how I needed to release my fear, what I really needed to do in order to heal. So to cut a long story short, I thought, well, I better start an organization for survivors of childhood trauma because there isn't one and we deserve one. I can't get the help I want. What happens to people who have less ability than I do to to find such organizations? So I started originally an organization called ASCA, now the Blue Knot Foundation. And that was, we created groups all over Australia, 55 groups, and that was good. But then I discovered that just talking about our trauma doesn't really help either. In fact, people were kind of getting a bit stuck in what I call a victim mode, became their identity. And I realized we actually needed a place where we could actually heal together. And so um, I gave up my career and left Sydney and bought 300 acres in the country because I knew that what I needed was to be away from other people in order to heal. So I assumed that other survivors would be the same. And built with the help of all sorts of volunteers and other survivors and amazing people, uh, we built our first centre called Mayu Maori in, in the country in Australia. And since then, we've had eight and a half thousand people have been here. We now have three centres on the property, one for kids, one for adults and one for private or personal retreats and what we created was a program a five-day program so that people could come here actually feel so safe that they could allow themselves to release the pain and the fear acknowledge feelings from their childhood they'd always have to push down causing anxiety depression 
all the other effects that many of our listeners will identify with. And, and we, this program is basically just allowing a safe place for survivors to come. But importantly, it's run by survivors for survivors. It's, it's, it, we're all on our own healing journey. So nobody pretends to be a professional know-all. Of course, <laughs> over the years since then, I, I've done masses of training and you know, I've got my master's in counseling and all those qualifications and I've studied and I really know about the brain now. And so do all the people who work with me. So I, but the psychologists we employ, the therapists, all of them are survivors of childhood trauma who have undertaken the program and are committed to their own ongoing healing. So what I think we, why our program works is it's, it's a peer support program. Sure. And I think probably your listeners will be thinking, yes, but what, what did you uncover? So I, so I will just say, I, I like many people, I first of all uncovered um, sexual abuse by a doctor in hospital. And in fact, my autobiography was published about that. But then I slowly unpeeled the onion and then remembered sexual abuse by my father and satanic ritual abuse. And it's been a fascinating journey of discovery that I've only learned what I could deal with at any one moment. And I may still recover memories of trauma from my childhood, but I now... Let's talk about that, Liz, a little bit, because I think that there's a whole lot of people who may not understand that these things can show up later in our lives, that we might just be moving on down the road, living our life, living our best life and have no idea. And then all of a sudden something triggers a memory. Absolutely. Um, So I was triggered by going to hospital in the middle of the night for the birth of my niece. And that triggered the memory of at the age of five being rushed to a hospital, which led to the sexual abuse by a doctor. And until then, I had thought I was just a perfectly, you know, perfect. I've had funny feelings inside of not being good enough. And I was a complete disaster at school. So I had all the symptoms of childhood trauma without actually realizing that's what had caused my Mm -hmm. problems in life. I remember having something come up um, from my own experience years ago that I had forgotten about. And it was kind of one of those, it was just one of those things where I was put in a position many, many times as a youngster to, to kind of be the adult in the room. And in this particular situation, I was behind the, the wheel of a car driving because the responsible adults uh, couldn't, even though I didn't have a license and, and oh. had no idea really how to drive and ended up in the middle of a, a pretty dicey neighborhood and kind of woke up from a trance. And I remembered that and I thought, oh, wow, that's abuse. That, (laughs) and I don't mean to laugh about it, Liz, it's, but it was, it was just so shocking because it went from, oh, well, that's just, that's really not okay. Mm. And yet I hadn't really thought about it. It hadn't come up. It was just something, I'm an adult and, and I don't even remember what made me remember that particular moment. But so these things can come up at any time for us. I think they come up when we're emotionally ready. I am a great believer that we only are given what we're ready to deal with. And yeah, therefore, okay. no one ever has to worry about stuff that starts coming up, but rather embrace it and go, oh, that was a nightmare. Oh, I wonder what that's about. And curiously explore it rather than Love going, it. I don't want to know about that. Why am I having nightmares? Why can't I sleep? Why am I so depressed? It's it's having a curiosity to explore what one's inner self is trying, mm. is trying to let us know. Yeah. And Wonderful. the more we suppress it, um, the worse it is for us. The more we suppress it, the more we, we can get chronic fatigue syn- syndrome, fibromyalgia, become alcoholics, um, have shocking migraines. All sorts of ways our body, either physically or emotionally, tries to cope with our suppression of truth. Let's talk about the Heal for Life model of healing. Mm, sure. The Heal for Life model is, has been devised by survivors for survivors, and it is quite simply allowing ourselves to be in a sufficiently safe place, to go back, to allow ourselves to remember what happened in the past. So like the incident you were talking about with our model, you would have allowed yourself to go back there knowing that if it had been forgotten, then it is a trauma 
And the reason it will be, have been forgotten is because there was too much fear involved at the time. Okay. So it is the release of that fear that stops us being triggered, stops us behaving, stops us reacting to say, maybe you were reacting to driving. And it's as we, after we've released the fear, our model is about then empowering the child. So if it was in your incidence, you might turn to your parents and at the age you were then say to your parents, that wasn't, that wasn't okay. That was not appropriate. That was wrong. Yeah. And you might release anger as it were at them in your imagination or actually. And, and then we, we nurture ourselves and acknowledge and say, well, that did happen and it's okay because I'm okay now and I, and I love me and, and I can move forward. That's putting it in a very short, simplistic way, but I think it's the fear. It's suppression of fear that creates all our problems. And it's when we allow ourselves to acknowledge the fear, which we often have to do to start with, uh, with a therapist on a program. Um, some, in, we have to be really, really safe to be able to do that. But it's that fear that seems to set up all these shocking uh, symptoms in our body and in our brains. Until we release the fear, our lives are lived in fear. That fear is expressed in other ways, maybe expressed as anger, it may be expressed as being antisocial, it may, it may be expressed as isolation. Fear drives our lives rather than love, which as you said at the beginning, life is about joy and happiness and discovery and an openness, not about fear closed in I don't dare connect with the outside world. I'm not good enough, right. etc. Let's explore the link between childhood trauma and mental illness. Well, we know all the research and the statistics that the vast amount of mental illness um, people have suffered also from childhood trauma. I mean, every year new statistics come out, but somehow people seem unwilling to make the connection. Um, certainly. 90% of the people who come on our programs used to be, it's lessening now, um, have, have been diagnosed with a mental illness. And there's no question that the mental illness, to one year after our program, 63% of people who would be diagnosed with having a serious mental illness using our government scales no longer have a mental illness. That's from starting after, you know, after just one year of working on their healing. To me, this is fantastic. Uh, you know, to me, there's no, there's no, there's no question. <laughs> And I so long for everybody to be allowed for people to say, if you've got bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, whatever it is, explore your childhood, release the fear of your childhood from your childhood, and then see where your mental illness is. Uh, it's so much safer, so much better, so much happier. This long-term diagnosis of people that you are going to be that way for the rest of your life is simply not true in my experience. I agree. So many get stuck in it, you know, get, get stuck yep. in the victim space and in the, and I don't want to say this properly because I don't mean to be disrespectful, but mm -hmm. the, I'm a survivor. That, that's the other one. That is for me, I, I just love everyone to hear. If we dwell on without healing from our childhood, yeah. we are reinforcing the neurons and we are debilitating and disempowering ourselves. Healing is about empowering ourselves to say, I am more than my childhood. I learned through, I experienced. That's why when I kind of forget to say what my childhood is about, because I have, it's made me who I am, but I have no interest in telling your viewers my terrible childhood because it's not what's important to me. Right, it, it, right. You know, it's no energy to me now. I don't, I, I, it's, you know, my father was appalling. It was all dreadful. Yes, but I, but it, I've released all the fear and the anger and the pain, and it, it's you know, it just makes me who I am. So we yeah, can and look at and look at what that those experiences, exactly. what they've led you to create. That's that's the whole point of it, and it and it's it takes courage to heal. So all the people who say I have a mental illness, so that's it. It's so understandable because you have been so disempowered mm -hmm. by the system, by your childhood. So anyone who's listening, who's got anxiety, depression, or any mental illness, just see if you've got the courage to say, hey, maybe I'll just have a little look at my childhood. Certainly mm -hmm. about my book. Certainly read my book, read other books. Just 
invite yourself to know that it's our fear of our childhood that stops us releasing the fear of the childhood. Right. And, and, and any help you want in overcoming the fear, your program, you know, use everything, but don't allow yourself to be less than you were created to be. No doubt. Let's dig into the connection with our inner child and, and creativity oh. and how that can help us heal. For me, the inner child, our inner self, um, is really my right brain. We have two parts of our brain, our right brain and our left brain. Our right brain is our creative, emotional brain and our unconscious brain, and that is where our trauma sits. Our left brain is our logical thinking, math brain, the one that works out problems, sorts out how to live in life. For survivors of trauma, we have less connection the bridge that combines those two called the corpus callosum is much thinner. So we much more easily get stuck in our right brain or our left brain. Healing is really reaching into my right brain, into my emotional self to allow myself to heal. So it, it's like building that bridge, which is not strong because it hasn't been able to grow and allowing myself to feel, to create, to be, to be open. And, and that's what the inner child is. You can, you can just look at it totally scientifically. You can look at it as a feeling, like an inner child. People get hung up on the word. It's not the word. It's, it's allowing ourselves to build that connection between our logical, adult, self-protective self to that vulnerable, emotional, right brain self mm -hmm. so that we become whole. One of my favorite uh, practices for healing your inner child is to find a picture of yourself mm. as a youngling and create an altar for her perhaps of things that you might still have mementos from your childhood or at least a picture and whatever else that you deem necessary and to uh, put that in a space that you can honor her or him that young one in you and every time you pass by or stand in front of it mm. you can send so wow. much love and sweetness that's a wonderful that's idea and i'm going to steal it immediately but i will try to remember to give you credit <laughs> 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 because, because that is exactly that's a, another wonderful way i mean you can go and get a doll and hold it and be i mean it, it's every way it's connecting with that with that child self and loving it because for so many of us, we actually hate our child self. I don't yeah. want, don't talk to me about my child. Oh, I hate me myself as I, Oh, I was such an awful child. It's saying, no, no, start to love your inner self. Start yeah. to love who you, because that little child did the best they possibly could. And right. it wasn't their fault what happened to them. And while we blame ourselves, we self harm, we, we drink, we, we hurt ourselves. And, um, no, no child, no child deserves to be hurt or to be frightened. No, no child. So I think that's a wonderful idea. Thank you, Shan. I, I think that's, uh, that's brilliant. <laughs> How can we change the impact of the shame and the powerlessness that comes from being a survivor, from learning about childhood trauma in, in a, place you know takes your breath away uh, like mm. you having that trigger going to hospital and and then everything just coming forward like you said it wouldn't come forward if you weren't ready for it or ready to heal it but there's so much weight in that shame and powerlessness well the shame is believing it was our fault now i just like everyone to remember or learn or hear up until the age of nine all children are narcissistic that's a self-survival. But what it means is we blame ourselves for anything that happens. If dad, uh, mum and dad get divorced when we're four years old, we think it's our fault. It doesn't matter that mum says, it's not your fault, darling. Inside, we believe it's our fault. And in the same way, any trauma and abuse that happens, we actually believe it's our fault. So therefore, we, we blame ourselves, not mm -hmm. consciously, but in our unconscious right brain. So that's why this loving of our inner self, that saying it's okay, it wasn't your fault, is a critical first step. It's acknowledging, it's loving, it's saying whatever happened to me, it wasn't my fault. 
it wasn't my fault I kept going back to the next door neighbor and I kept being sexually abused. You went back because you probably, maybe you needed love. You went back because the person was an asshole. No, nothing that happens. I've, I've done uh, work in a high security prison in England and it was really sad because this was the, you know, the mass murderers, uh, mass rapists I was working with. And for, for many of them, the hardest thing they still just so totally blamed themselves and now interestingly blamed themselves for the crimes they had committed and found it so hard to set to forgive themselves sure. forgiving ourselves and loving ourselves is the first thing or a very critical part of, of early healing it's saying it wasn't my fault of course if we've done something dreadful in the end it's saying sorry to that person i'm not meaning it, you just wipe out anything you did that's wrong but I, right right it's it's owning it wasn't our fault that each of us is born is the most beautiful, perfect, gorgeous child. And what happened to us is a consequence of adults who should have known better. Right. And I'm not blaming the adults who hurt us either because they may have been abused. This isn't a, a blame game. And anyone who's thinking, oh, no, I can't, my parents, they tried. They, of course they did their best. But it still doesn't mean the child within doesn't need to be angry at them, doesn't need to release their fear and their hurt and their anger. Yeah. And when we do, we have a better relationship with our parents in the now. So of course. all of this is healing and brings more love into the world because we're not blaming and angry and hurting yeah. and passing on pain to everybody. We're saying we're, we're, by healing ourselves, we heal those around us. Without question, I was thinking about my my own experience with with my father I, after my daughter was born i took a break in my relationship with my father for uh, a decade i was absolutely done with mm. any of any of the shenanigans and i knew i had some deep work to do for myself and so that i could show up and be the the very best mom i could be to my daughter and and to my husband you know as a, as his partner and it was a really really good decision. I'm grateful that I made the decision. And I'm also grateful for the healing that took place in between and for the reconciliation that happened and that I had time with him before he passed away. And I was able to understand things in such a different light and such a just more love and spaciousness and, and no more anger and no... I'd worked through it all. I worked through it. It was such a freeing, beautiful thing. And I, and I have, I might sound a little bit loony, but I, I have a better relationship with him now that he's on the other side <laughs> uh, in, the, in the way that I think of him and the way that I speak with him and the way that I understand uh, mm -hmm. some of the choices that he made, the way that I understand that that he was a good human being. Anyway, it goes on and on. And it is an example of, of what can happen when you do the work. Oh, absolutely. And, and can't, we have to have a pause. We can't go, oh, I'm not going to blame my father. We have to release, as you said, the anger, the fear, the pain. We have to move through it before we can have a good relationship. We exactly. can't just go, okay, I'm going to forgive him and forget it. No, that isn't no. what we <laughs> Well, that was the yeah. thing too, I'll tell you. It, it took... It took a decade, as I, as I said, and the one thing that I found interesting is in that time, as angry as he was, that, that I was just not available. I was not yeah. available. He never stopped trying. Yeah. And finally, one day, I was ready. Yep. And, yeah, that, you know, pretty much blew his mind. I was ready. I was like, okay, I'm ready. And, and here, are my, here are my terms, and here are my boundaries, and this is what this is going to look like. And for some people, their parent doesn't seem to care enough to even try and chase them and have the relationship. Exactly. And there's a whole lot of healing from that as well. So sure. letting go of our fear and our pain. And it, it's not easy. It's not easy at all, but we can all do it. And yes. the, who benefits from it? Me. <laughs> Each yeah, of us. Right. It's, Each of us. It's choice. Each of us, anyone who's listening, obviously does want to do get rid of their anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety is the suppression of fear. So if you want to lose your anxiety, Start looking at your childhood, start realizing where you were frightened in your childhood because it's fear 
that activates the amygdala in the brain. Um, it is fear that is the driving force. And when we release it, then the brain stops reacting to things that are happening in the now. I've in my book really explained it in simple, in simple English for people to understand exactly what happens to us. Because I think when we understand what happens to our brain from trauma, because trauma is more emotion than we can deal with than we perceive as life-threatening. Right. So when we heal from our trauma, when we know how, understand it, what has happened to us, then we can also take away some of the blame and realize, oh, I'm not nutty. I'm not, I'm not a waste of space. I'm not stupid. It's just my brain has formed differently because of what happened to me. Right. And because the brain is plastic, because the brain can change, I can change and it's my choice. Yes. So nobody yes. has to stay the way they are. Nobody yeah, has to that. stay where you are. You, you can change if you want to. And if yes. you want to, well, you're listening to this program. Now's a very good time to start. Yeah, While it's Shannon, Shannon, myself, to think, okay, I mean, sure, go and buy my book, listen to Shannon's other podcasts, but, but make a decision, hey, I, I really don't have to stay the way I am. It's yes. a choice. But you can stay the way you are, but then please don't blame other people or ring up your friends and say how awful your life is because you have chosen to stay that way. You yeah. didn't choose your childhood, but you can choose how you are as an adult. Where can our listeners get a copy of your book? It's all the usual places. Okay, you good. Can download it on Amazon. Uh, but if you want to most help us, we are a charity. I'm a volunteer. We run everything we do. Every dollar we make goes to helping more survivors. Uh, so going onto our website and buying a hard copy direct from us, if, you ha if that happens to, to work for you, gives us more more support for us to help survivors but really it, actually i most care about you buying it in whatever way you can because all it's 20 years of what i've learned in 20 years of yeah. helping survivors to heal from being a survivor myself so i just want anyone listening to know they can heal and our website is healforlife.com.au or just look up heal for life and you'll probably find the book anyway. Liz, I'm so grateful that you wanted to have this conversation today. What a, what a treat and what a treasure you are. I'm so grateful to you and all the work that you're doing with Heal for Life. Your new book is fantastic. And to our listeners, you can get Heal for Life wherever books are sold. And 100% of the book's proceeds go back to Heal for Life to pay for survivors to attend programs because many people can't afford to pay. And Liz believes that the finances should not be a barrier to healing. They're self-funded and, um, and many come for free because yep. they don't receive any government funding. So get a copy of the book at healforlife.com.au. Come back to the show notes and take a peek at some of the offerings that Liz will be bringing forward Zoom calls will be available so that we, uh, our classroom gets, uh, the world gets a lot smaller when we have these Zoom casts and yeah. conversations for healing. Yes, how grateful we can all be to, to the coronavirus from, for getting us all to communicate more to the world via a technical means. I would have been traveling around the world instead of which here I am at home and, and what a blessing it is. Well, thanks again, Liz. It was a pleasure. Lovely to talk to you, Shan. I hope we talk again sometime soon.